You know, when I was your age, go ask your mother. I know you don't like it. It builds character. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Hello, listener, and welcome to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. And if you are looking for some fatherly wisdom for your career, your family, or any other aspect of your life, then you've come to the right place. If you want to learn more about Datages, find additional content, submit questions or feedback to me, or if you want to know if that mental picture you have of me after hearing my voice matches my real face, visit datages.com. Thanks for being here. And before you listen to our podcast, please listen to your father. Welcome back to Datages. Here we are at episode seven. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. Thanks for joining us again. In episode 5B of Datages, I had the opportunity and the distinct honor to introduce you to Sean Collinson, and he spoke about his recent near-death experience and the impact that it had on his life. He described his transcendent experience in what he called the whiteout, and that moment which he referred to as the nanosecond, when he was instantaneously confronted with the finite nature of life. It was in that nanosecond that he reevaluated his priorities, his approach to life, and the fact that tomorrow is not guaranteed to any one of us. Sean's message is truly powerful, and I encourage you to go back and listen to episode 5B if you haven't already. Recently, I was confronted by this same notion, not through my own experience, but through the loss of a friend. Just a few months ago, I had to say goodbye to a Stanford classmate, Nate Lipscomb, who was taken far too young at the age of 46, my age. Today's datage is one I hold too strongly. Good health is not the only thing that matters, but without good health, nothing else matters. I'm sure the connection between the loss of my friend Nate and today's datage requires no explanation at all. Nate's passing was a shock and a tragedy. He was a prominent attorney at a major Silicon Valley technology company. He had a wife and two boys who were just a few years younger than my own. At age 46, he seemed to be in perfect health. He was an avid outdoorsman, a runner, and particularly loved surfing. He traveled the world having adventures with his family. His death was truly unexpected, and in a way, although Nate died of a heart attack, he was also a victim of the pandemic though he won't be counted in any of the statistics. Let me explain. Nate had COVID shortly before his tragic passing. He started to experience chest pains at one point, and he thought it was related to symptoms of long COVID. He did not seek medical care or examination. After a couple of days, he went out for his typical run. Sadly, he did not return. Nate's circumstance is so frustrating at one level to know that this young, brilliant family man had access to the best healthcare in the entire world. He lived just miles from Stanford University Medical Center, yet he was unaware of his underlying cardiovascular health. I'm not going to delve any further into Nate's health circumstances out of respect for his privacy, but let me open up here and share with you my own journey with cardiovascular health. I've been health conscious since about 13 years old. I was obese at that stage of my life, partially due to a condition that resulted in cartilage degeneration in my knees. Mostly though, I was just a fat kid. I ate fast food almost daily. Our family tradition was going to Pizza Hut every Friday night, where I would throw down slice after slice. Our standard order was double sausage and mushroom with anchovies on half. My mom loves her anchovies. I can still picture that old Pizza Hut with the traditional red roof, and the dimly lit red vinyl booths and dark wood interior. I can even remember the Pac-Man game that sat by the front door. You know, the old sit-down table style with the screen on top, covered by a sheet of thick glass that would withstand any amount of marinara sauce, soda, and beer spilled on it over the years. Perhaps the worst part of our traditional Friday night pizza fest was the fact that we would always take home leftovers to have cold pizza for Saturday morning breakfast. I can remember waking up and going straight to the fridge to grab the pizza box 
and start chomping on pizza while plopped in front of the TV watching Saturday morning cartoons. What were my other fat kid pleasures? Uh, let's see. We hit the drive through almost every single day for fast food. Burger King was our primary stop. Sausage, egg, and cheese crust sandwich for breakfast, or the chicken sandwich made like a Whopper, no onions, in the afternoon on the way home from school. Yes, I do remember my Burger King orders. Have it your way, right? I would eat Cool Whip out of the freezer with a spoon. Stewie Griffin from Family Guy would be proud had he been around to witness it. Cool Whip. I would also eat peanut butter directly out of the container. Spoon after spoon after spoon, as if peanuts were going to go to extinct. Jif Creamy was my go-to, by the way. Or sometimes, I would put heaping scoops of peanut butter in a bowl mixed with honey or raisins or both. And yes, I think there were times that I would double up with peanut butter and Cool Whip. Did I mention I was a fat kid? Around this time of age 13 or 14, I can remember vividly my father sitting me down on the edge of my bed in my room with the Star Wars-themed wallpaper trim looking down upon us and saying something very sensitive and supportive along the lines of, you know you're fat, right? I think Luke, Leia, and Han, and even Chewie were embarrassed for me. It was a hard moment for me, which is obviously etched in my mind, but it was also a turning point in my life. From that moment, I remember starting to eat better, being more active and exercising more. I joined the swim team at school. That would whip me into shape over the next few years of discipline soaked in chlorine. I won't say that everything that transpired in those years was healthy for a teenager. There was a lot of crash dieting and slim fast. A shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and eat a sensible dinner. And by my junior year of high school, when I joined the year-round swim team and was training twice a day throughout the week and once on Saturdays, swimming had definitely become excessive. I totally burnt out. I did some lasting damage to my shoulders, and to this day, I can't smell chlorine without having flashbacks. Over the next several years, I would find a balance, particularly once I got to Stanford. I ate a super healthy and clean diet, and I worked out religiously. I was a bit of a gym rat as I approached my 20s, and I definitely bulked up from pumping iron. I was on the collegiate water ski team and would go on to ski some professional events as well. Body-wise, I was in good shape. There was just a lot more of that shape than there happens to be today. I was much heavier, clocking in at about 6'1 and 220 pounds. Continuing through my 20s and into my 30s, diet and exercise were a really big part of my life. I introduced yoga into my regimen about 17 years ago, actually 18 in two weeks, and at one point did a stint as a CrossFitter. It would be accurate to say I was health conscious. It would be more accurate to say that I was a health freak. Why did I do all of this? There were, and still are, several reasons, and I'm sure many of you will be able to relate to one or more of these in your own lives. Vanity is one. I liked the visible results of being a workout machine. I was proud of the body I could achieve through hard work. For me, though, and I think this is true for many of us, vanity and insecurity are two sides of the same coin, or perhaps two sides of the same mirror. When I looked in the mirror, I still saw that fat kid, and that drove me harder to be in the best shape I could. I never wanted to go back, that's for sure. I never wanted anyone ever again to say, Chad, you know you're fat, right? Listener, have you had a poignant experience like this with a parent where there are certain words from a parent that are etched into your mind and have become a part of how you define yourself? This is part of what we talked about last week with Sean Collinson. Share with us on Facebook or Instagram or send me a private message at datages.com. I'd really like to hear from you. For me, fear was a factor as well in my lifelong pursuit of fitness. I didn't exactly win the genetic lottery when it comes to cardiovascular condition. My paternal grandfather, Harry, had a heart attack at a very young age. He recovered, but passed of a stroke later in life. My father has had a high cholesterol and has regulated it with statins for the majority of his adult life. And my mother, too, has wound up on statins for high cholesterol later in life. 
At around age 30, I not only saw my test results for blood lipids, or what we conventionally refer to generically as cholesterol, start to worsen. In my case, I also saw increasing blood pressure to a range that was considered elevated or borderline hypertension. Given how hard I had worked my entire life to be in peak physical condition, inside and out, this was demoralizing and really frustrating. But eventually, I let go of those useless frustrations and accepted my realities. That process didn't happen overnight. It took years. As I said, I simply had to step back and accept that I could not control my genetics. None of us can. Exercise has always been my escape, too. When I'm pushing my body to the limits, that's one of the few times that my mind is clear, and I'm not thinking about other things. The other times are when I'm at high speeds, snow skiing, water skiing, auto racing. I've found moments of clarity at the edge. Similarly, exercise has always been a competitive outlet for me. While I'm smart enough not to judge my own fitness by comparison to others, I do enjoy a group exercise setting where people push one another. When I train with others who are at an elite level of fitness, it pushes me. But it also pushes me when I have an opportunity to lead by example in a group fitness setting with people who are less intense than I am. There have been many times I've been encouraged to actually become a group exercise instructor, but that hasn't been my calling. At some level, I prefer not to think when I work out and to just let someone else tell me what to do. The group exercise setting has also often played an important role in my social life. The interaction and engagement that grows out of such settings with like-minded individuals committed to a healthy lifestyle creates a great community. It's certainly better than socializing at bars and clubs in my mind. Have I shared with you listeners that I actually met my wife Nina in a spin class at the Equinox in Encino, California? I'll share that full story sometime on another episode. I invite you, listener, also to share your fitness story with us. Join the discussion on our socials. Let us know what fitness means to you. Share funny or noteworthy fitness stories and let us know where you fall on the fitness spectrum, from couch potato to fitness junkie. When it comes to a holistic perspective of health, I think there's one philosophical perspective that means more to me than any other. It goes all the way back to my early childhood. I remember when I was growing up, I had the perception of my father as being older, I can't really characterize or quantify what that meant for me. He wasn't terribly active and wasn't really engaged in any activities with me growing up. I have few memories of us doing active things together. Water skiing when I was younger and snow skiing throughout my childhood are the only things that really stick out. I think this is why I perceived of my father as being older, as I said. My father has shared with me his philosophy about hardcore exercise. He says, Chad, we only get so many heartbeats in our lives. Exercising too much just uses them all up faster. Later in my life, when I was an adult, but before I had kids, I met a professional Major League Baseball athletic trainer named Steve, who had two children and was super active and engaged in their lives. He was incredibly youthful in my eyes. He was one of the inspirations for me wanting to have kids while I was still young so I could be as active and engaged as a father as he was. But here's where perception and math are at odds. I did the calculations one day. I determined that my father was 28 when I was born. And how old was Steve when his kids were born? 42. My mind was blown. Ironically, I think my own father has been far more active as he's gotten older. He has been a world traveler and an adventurer in his 50s, 60s, and now 70s. Particularly on an age-adjusted basis, he's really going strong. And as we discussed in episode 5, his adventures culminated this year with a trip into space on Blue Origin. I can't even imagine where his adventures will take him into his 80s. There's a trite expression, age is just a state of mind. I'm not sure I really buy that. The mind is a powerful force. I think a youthful mindset keeps the mind young. But as the Romans used to say, men sana in corpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. The most youthful of minds still requires a healthy vessel in which to house it. What I've learned is that age is a state of health, clean living, an active lifestyle, good diet, mindfulness, exercise, 
These things all lead to an increase in longevity. And when I say longevity, I'm not just talking about length of life. I'm talking about length of quality life. Going back to my friend Steve, he managed to extend his quality lifespan by taking phenomenal care of himself. That was not a self-centered approach to life. Instead, it made him more youthful, vibrant, engaged, and fun for the other people in his life, particularly his children. I feel that this is the greatest gift he could have possibly given his family, and it became a priority objective for me to do the same. I wanted to invest in the quality of my health so I could extend the quality of life I had to offer myself and to the people I loved most. This is where I'd like to come full circle back to Nate. While his life was cut tragically short, the pastor and his family and closest friends at his funeral made it a true celebration of the quality of life and quality of time he had provided his family while he was with them. While he worked hard, he invested in active engagement and play with his two boys. They got the best of him and had more quality time with their father than many children whose dads go on to live a complete lifetime. Nate made the right investments when he was still here to provide his family and friends with memories that will live on long after his passing. For that, I commend you, Nate. God bless you and your family. Since Nate's passing, I find myself asking with some frequency, have I done the same as Nate? Have I done enough to create meaningful, lasting memories with my own children? I know for certain that when my boys were in their early years, the answer was no. I was, like my father before me, very focused on the growth of my own business when they were young, and that took me away from the household. I know that I missed out on some of those early bonding experiences and the memory making that occurs during that period. Nearly a decade ago, our family went through divorce between the mother of my boys and me. As it is for any family, those were trying and difficult times. But for me, it was also a turning point. I began to view myself not as a divorced dad, but as a single father on a half-time basis every other week when I had my boys with me. This mindset was really transformative to me. I didn't look at the things I did to take care of my boys in this single parent role as a burden. I looked at them as an opportunity, a privilege, and a second chance to be a meaningful part of their lives. I'm sure that we will devote more than one episode in the future to topics around divorce and single parenting. There's much to discuss for certain. Please let me know what topics in this arena are most important to you. Email me directly at chad at datages.com. But let's talk for a moment about the other component of Nate's lesson to all of us. Have some fun. Have I shared enough fun with my boys? Have I had enough fun, period? The unfortunate but honest answer here is also a no for me. While my life in the past couple of decades has been filled with meaningful pursuits, it hasn't included quite enough fun without meaning. You know, fun where the only meaning is fun itself. And I'm afraid I haven't modeled the pathway to fun enough for my boys. I'm hoping that just as I did a decade ago, I can process Nate's lesson, his gift to me that I now share with you. Listeners, find some fun in your life, just for the sake of fun, and share it with your children. Chad, find some fun in your life, just for the sake of fun, and share it with your children. I also want to pause here and offer a gift to all of you listeners, courtesy of my friend Nate. It is the gift of awareness. I've provided in the bulletin board on datages.com under this episode six, links to resources to help all of you become more aware of your cardiac health. These resources will provide you with guidance on recommended cardiac screenings and some suggestions as to where you might look to find qualified medical providers in your area. I ask you, please, please, please invest in your health for your sake and for the sake of your families. Take the time. Make it a priority. The people you love most will thank you. And with that, I offer you one final piece of medical advice for the day in the form of our dad joke. Smoking can kill you. 
Too much bacon can kill you. But smoking bacon cures it. Remember, listeners, Dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. Thank you for listening to Dadages. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to visit dadages.com and subscribe to the Dadages podcast to get notified for future episodes. You can rate or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so. Just a little respect is all I ask for. I put a roof over your head and food on the table and what do you do? No, tell me exactly what do you do because I am doing everything. I'm paying for everything. No, get back here. Get back here right now.